All right, so I'm Kyle Acker, and this is why is building components in Drupal so difficult? Uh, if you need the slides, because you can't see it on the projector, the tiny URL is on the board. Um, it's just tinyurl.com slash bad components. And yeah, like I said, I'm Kyle Lanneker. I'm a senior technical architect at a company called Perficient. A little bit about me, I've been doing Drupal since 2014. Um, a, about a year ago, I moved from Asheville to, or from Chicago to Asheville. Uh, where I spend most of my time drinking some of the craft beers there or hiking trails. And the move is relevant because I remembered on the flight over here that airplane seats are very small. Um, this is the first real time I've flown a distance since COVID. And I did not enjoy remembering that. <laughs> so a little bit about proficient. It's probably this, the small 7,000 international digital, digital consultancy that you've never heard of. So yeah, we're a 7,000 person company spread across the globe. If you can think of a technology, we probably have a team for it. And Drupal is one of those technologies. So they've been very um, very kind in sponsoring me to be here and speak about why, about components. And I do believe we have a couple openings right now for developers, PMs, and BAs at, on our Drupal team. So if you're interested in that, check us out at proficient.com. All right, baseline stuff. Naming things is hard. So we're gonna get started with what I think a component is, what I think a component system is, and what makes a component system successful? Starting with components. In my mind, what is a component? Um, components store content, they don't store data. That means that if a value has some use outside of being rendered on the front end, don't store it in a component, right? If it's a recipe ingredient, if it's a song on a CD, if it's a chapter in a book, that's all data. Do not store it in a component. Um, if you need to display it in a component, use a reference and bring it in from your data store, from the entity, et cetera, as you need to render it. So that, that's a key distinction, because it means that components don't need to be functional with views or queryable, uh, and it really limits the use case for what you're gonna be doing with components, which makes them a lot simpler to build. And then, kind of the standard stuff, there's standalone, standalone modular UI element, um, they're expected to be reused across many pages and content types, and they can be embedded in other components authored as a standalone component or rendered programmatically. I'm going to try and get my notes bigger here so I can actually read them. All right, all right. Um, and then I think one thing that might be glossed over sometimes is that the data structure or the data model for a component is actually itself highly structured content. And in Drupal, if you, get, if you pass the wrong data to a Twig template, it just blows up your site. So it's very important to acknowledge that getting your data structure right and getting your data types right is important when you're passing them to a component template. Um, and then we're gonna be working through an example here of a simple component, right? So this is a simple side by side. There's some text on the left, there's an image on the right, and there's a link. So um, we'll be referencing this as we make our way through the presentation. Next, oh, one more important note. We are only talking about authorable components in this session. So when you're talking about components, you can talk about components that can be authored and are meant to build out the experience on a site, or you can talk more internally about a component on an editing page in the admin interface. And we're not going to be talking about those because those are more programmatically created and maintained by the Drupal as a system uh, and not really customized on a site-by-site, project-by-project basis. I think most of us probably are building authorable components, not programmatic um, components for the back end. So, Next up, what is a component system? One component isn't much use, we need a lot of components. So, this is not showing up well, but that's uh, pretend we're not developers and pretend we're in construction or something, right? And we're starting at a new job and they say, we need a new battery for the drill. Which shop would you wanna buy a battery for? The one that very clearly has a favorite brand and you just need to go buy the red one at um, Home Depot or something. Or the one, and there are circles here somewhere. Maybe I need to click. Yeah, nope. There we go. The one that has three different brand seals. This is um, a very simple illustration of the complexity that not having a system can, can uh, create, right? Because it turns from a simple task of go buy a new battery to which, which drill needs a battery? What size does it need to be? What brand is it, right? And then some, suddenly something that should have been fast is something that could easily have a mistake made and cost even more time. So, back to being developers. What is a component system? A component system is not a design system. That is a very important distinction. Um, design systems are built for an organization and they're organizational wide. They're usually meant to 
have brand consistency across all the marketing channels, and they're usually meant to be used um, in various different mediums, right? And they, for success, they absolutely require executive level sponsorship, so your C level, your VP level, your director level, etc. Without that, to enforce adoption of a design system is just going to fail. But fortunately, you can build a component system without executive level sponsorship. You just need buy-in from the, the owners or stakeholders of a site. So a component system is not a design system. A component system is also not simply a collection of components because if you have 10 components built differently, that's not a system, that's just 10 components. What a component system is, is a collection of components using common patterns. So um, some example of the common aspects that you can find in components, a lot of these are gonna look like theming common aspects because they are, because all of your components are themed. So components are gonna be used atomically or like I said, laid out on the page. And it's important to acknowledge that the, the audience or the users of a component are not just developers, they're not just your site visitors. It's also your content authors, your designers, and your stakeholders. So really, everybody that's interacting with the site in some way is an audience for your component system. And then, so now we're back to our example component. When we're looking at this, it looks like a simple enough component, but once you start getting into a system, this turns into four separate atoms if we're building atomically, and then two component-specific fields. So our atoms break down to a header, a description, a link, and media, and then our component-specific fields are, does the media go on the left or the right? And is there a background color? So it's not this, a simple component can become deceivingly complex, right? This is four fields, or four, four different, yeah, it essentially looks like it's four fields, but it's really four atoms and two fields. And then diving even deeper, let's just look at the header. In my experience, a header is never simply just a text box. There's typically a text box, and then you need a display size, but you also need the element size, because authors want something to look like an H2, but they actually want it to be an H3 or an H4. So typically, when I build a header, it's not just a text box, it's three additional fields which again, just continues to add to the complexity of what a component system is and how you're building it. And then you get into how, you, how do you actually use the component. So how is this authored, right? Is this a left, right, left pattern that's enforced? Is it limited to three um, in a row? Is it a listing? Is it three individual components placed on a page? Um, is it a new component with a repeating field set? And the answer is, there is no wrong answer. It depends on the site, it depends on the business, it depends on who you're building um, who you're building the site for and really what the designs say. And that also adds to the complexity because you want consistency in your component system. If you're going to say this is a left-right-left left pattern in force of three, then when you see that in other pages on other designs, you should also be following that, um, that precedent so that when authors create something, they know what to expect. And that goes into the... You know, Authors knowing what to expect when they create a page and then not being surprised that they can't do something or that they can do something. And that just enforces consistency for developers, designers, and authors. All right. And then what makes a component system successful? This gets into a lot of opinion-based stuff. Um, if you disagree, I'd be very interested to talk with you afterwards. But I'm, I'm hoping that most of us agree with this. So. First thing, um, buy-in from all users of the site. So like we said, this is going to be the designers, the developers, the stakeholders, um, any other business units or business uh, people that are involved in the building of this site. If one group doesn't buy in, um, it can make implementation take longer, more, be more expensive, or it can simply outright fail, right? If your designers aren't on board with doing a component-based design, that's going to be catastrophic. Um, if your authors can't wrap their mind around how to author pages in a component-based system, they're not going to create a good experience. And if your developers don't have experience or don't want to build components, they're not going to build components. So you really need buy-in from everybody that's going to be touching the site and everybody that's going to be using the site to be successful. And then you need to remember that for the lifetime of a site, when you're building it, that's a relatively small part of the total lifetime of a site. Right, you're building it for six months, 12 months, maybe even 18 or 24. But sites live for somewhere between three to seven years. So there's gonna be people that follow you. Um, there's gonna be people working on the site after you. So when you're building a component system, you're not building it for yourself, even though it is gonna make the initial build faster, you're building it for the people that are gonna follow you, right? 
So the authors that are going to have to live with the site day to day, the marketers that are going to have to figure out how to make it engaging for their audience or their visitors, um, the business stakeholders that have business goals to achieve, and then future designers and future developers who are going to want to change, uh, change the site to enhance or change the strategy to get more engagement. So just remember you're building for the end user, you're not building for today, and you're not building just to get the site done. And then another important aspect, as we touched on, consistent experience. So the designs, the authoring development, across the board when you're creating something, you want to create it in the same way every time. And if you're doing something different, there should be a reason for it. Because if it's not consistent, it makes it a lot harder to wrap your head around and to build a mental model of, and to then work in that system as well. Because if you can't identify what is the right way to do something, you're gonna do it the way you know how to do it. And the way you know how to do it probably doesn't align with how somebody in the past did it or somebody in the future is gonna do it. So then you have many different approaches to solving the same problem. All right. Another important aspect is lowering the barrier to entry um, and just acknowledging that there is a barrier to entry working on a site. The first one is don't be clever. If you have an option between being clever and choosing and doing something obvious, choose the obvious solution because being clever is hard to understand later um, for either future you or for somebody following you. So it's a lot better just, even if it's four, five, 10 more lines of code, just do it the obvious way instead of the clever way. Um, this is particularly painful in the JavaScript community. They love their one-liners and it can be a pain to dissect what they're doing later. And then, uh, you sit, along the same lines, you send your approaches over Drupalisms because Drupalisms require Drupal knowledge to work with successfully, whereas if you're using standard HTML, standard JavaScript, standard CSS approaches, it's going to be a lot easier for somebody with less Drupal experience to come in and work in that component system successfully. And then actively address implicit or institutional knowledge buildup. So a good example of this is if I say, we need to do X on the site, and you think, oh, this person can do this, and only this person can do that, can do this. That is an example of implicit or institutional knowledge buildup. They have something in their head that says, I know how to do this work that you don't feel confident other people can do, um, which is problematic because it means if they leave or if they're busy, then nobody can do that work. So a big part of doing a component system successfully is addressing the implicit knowledge buildup and documenting it and making it explicit or removing the need for that um, implicit knowledge by changing approach. So you wanna address that as it pops up and it, it's gonna be a thing where you recognize that it's building up and then you address it and then it's gonna start building up again, right? It's, it's gonna be a constant battle, it's not something you solve and then just let it be. And next big thing is discoverability. So in my opinion, a living style guide is the requirement for a successful component system because if you require a Drupal, a Drupal environment to discover your components, that is too high of a barrier of entry. It might not be for developers, it might not be for authors, but for business stakeholders and designers, they are not going to go into Drupal and author a component to see what options are available. They just want to go to a site, they want to be able to click around, and they want to be able to understand the system. So we pretty much only use Storybook at my company. Um, as far as, I'm, I think there are competitors to Storybook. As we were talking about, there is Pattern Lab, but I think Pattern Lab's pretty much lost market share at this point. Um, I certainly haven't used it in a long time. But I think there are some actual like, competitors or alternatives to Storybook in the JavaScript world. I'm just not aware of what they are. But those would work too. Uh, importantly, when you are doing your living style guide, you have to represent 100% of authoring functionality. If you don't have 100% of authoring functionality, what's gonna happen is, your authors are eventually gonna say, well, I can do this in Drupal, but I can't do it in Storybook, so why would I go to Storybook if Drupal is the, the source of truth, the canonical reference for what can and cannot be done in your component system. So you need to represent all the functionality and the limitations outside of Drupal so that they actually trust your living style guide to be accurate so that when they go into Drupal, they're gonna get the same thing and have the same options. Uh, this doesn't mean you have to replicate the authoring experience, right? You don't have to replicate this field is limited to five in the component um, fields, that might be something you just document, right? Like this field that accepts one to five values. And then one of the things that we found to be most beneficial is making the easiest development path um, 
being through the style guide for front end developers because it means that you're always going to have an accurate representation of what the component is if it was developed in Storybook first and then moved into Drupal. Whereas if you build it in Drupal, then you have to move it to Storybook, and that's kind of optional, right? If it works in Drupal, then it works on the site, and they can author it, and they can you can launch it. You can come back and do Storybook later. But if you're looking for a 100% accurate Storybook, then it needs to be in Storybook too. So going Storybook to Drupal makes it mandatory, whereas Drupal to Storybook under a time crunch, you're not going to do the storybook part, and if it's slow, your component system is going to fall apart. Now, what you'll notice um, in all these items is a lack of technology preferences or technology prescriptions, and a lack of technical criteria because the success of a component system doesn't really depend on the technology or the technical approach. It's a lot more about having <laughs> being consistent, having good standards, and just sticking to them, um, and then. Obviously, the success of your team is going to be somewhat dependent on the technology and te technical approach you take, but that's going to be more relevant to the problem you're trying to solve than having a component system. All right. So that's roughly what a component system is, and why I think is, and what it, and what I think it needs to be successful. Now on to you want a component system. What do you do then? So there's two big considerations to make. One is how you're going to be using your components, and two is going to be component architectures. So we're going to walk through both of them, starting with component usage. And we'll start with the coupled approach. So this is a traditional Drupal site. It's going to be built in and using Drupal. It's going to be dependent on Drupal to render correctly. It's going to make extensive usage of Drupal's template override and pre-processing systems. And some examples of this that I think we're all going to be familiar with are paragraphs, layout builder, nodes, blocks, terms, um, display modes, you know, Drupal templates and Twig, all that good stuff. That's going to be a coupled approach. It's highly dependent on Drupal, and you're not going to be able to use your components anywhere else. But if you're building one Drupal site and you don't foresee a need to ever use your components somewhere else, there's nothing wrong with a coupled approach. I know everybody talks about decoupled and headless, et cetera, but if you don't have the use case for it, most of them just add complexity. So then we go on to decouple. Um, and I, I'm not using the term, I think, and how it's modern and trendy to use it, in that we're decoupling from Drupal. It's more of a decoupling your component definitions from being dependent on Drupal. Um, so I like to call it independent a little bit. I think decoupled is a loaded term and can mean a lot of things. So this is more of when you're doing the storybook first approach. Components are created independent of Drupal with minimal or no Drupalisms in the templates. So that really means nothing from Twig Tweak, none of the special Drupal Twig functions. Um, a lot of the JavaScript helpers that Drupal provides, those shouldn't be used if they, if they aren't necessary. And it doesn't mean that you can't use them, it just means that it should be an acknowledgement that you're breaking the decoupling when you are using them, right? If, sometimes you just have to, and that's, that's fine. Sometimes that is the correct solution. But the preference should be for not using Drupalisms when you don't have to. Templates are intended for use in systems other than Drupal, right? So there's a lot of other systems that can render Twig. So if you're intending to have a Symfony application and a Drupal application using the same Twig components, then once again, you're going to want to avoid the Drupal Twig functions. And then developers may create components outside of Drupal and then integrate them. This is the storybook to Drupal first approach. Uh, we've seen some success with this as far as it allowing front-end developers to focus on what they're good at, right? Which is HTML, templating, CSS, JavaScript, and then not worrying so much about the Drupal side of things. And some examples of this are gonna be systems like Emulsify or Outline or Particle or Wingsuit. I think maybe UI Patterns falls into here somewhere, but I have them listed somewhere else. Um, I certainly don't have time to try out and fully understand all these systems. So if you think one belongs somewhere else, feel free to let me know, um, and I'll happily move it. Then we get into headless. Um, components are defend, defined and rendered outside of Drupal. Uh, Drupal is only, really only used as a content store, and really, this introduces a whole new fun set of problems that I just don't have time to talk about right now. So we're gonna move on. Some examples of this are gonna be Gatsby, Next.js, or Drux. Uh, really, when you're going about this, your component system is kind of the last of your concerns. There's a lot of other problems to solve. Um, they're certainly making strides, but it, it is a very complex approach. 
And then you have your monolithic systems. Uh, so opinion, these are opinion systems that are built on top of a coupled approach. And you can see there's a lot of examples of these, right? So there's Gutenberg from WordPress, there's Aqueous Site Studio, there's Drop Solid Rocket Ship, Rain, Pattern Kit, CL Components, which is a new one, um, and then UI Patterns, which I recently learned is actively being maintained again. So typically these, these take a very opinionated approach about how you're using Drupal. And they often introduce new paradigms or new approaches for how to solve some of, excuse me, some of Drupal's shortcomings as far as when you're creating components and how to make it either a better developer experience, a better authoring experience, better, oh, those are the two main ones. I personally tend to shy away from monolithic, monolithic solutions because I, I don't like being bound in by the compromises they make. And that, that usually comes from a fear of not understanding the compromises when I start using the system. I've found that regardless of what the monolithic system is doing, I'm eventually going to run into an edge case or uh, a use case that they don't support. And at that point, trying to customize or work outside the, 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 let's see, the envisioned uh, scope or envisioned approach for a monolithic uh, framework gets very difficult and very complex and very time consuming. So often it's easier to go back to client and say, we can't do this, and that's never a good, uh, well, we can't do this or this is gonna cost you a bunch of money. And neither of those are good things to say to a client. And now back to, or onto com common component architectures. First one that we're all familiar with, I hope, is paragraphs. Once again, we're going to be working through this example um, where we have four atoms, header, description, link, and media, and then two component specific fields, media left, media right, and background color. So starting off, we have some simple left-right logic. This really isn't important. It's just showing the rough logic that, uh, the rough template structure that we're going to be working in. Um, the two important things to note are that we have a media variable and a content variable that we'll be populating with various different approaches. So our first approach, coupled nested, um, our first approach is a coupled approach using nested paragraphs. I'm gonna say this once and I'll say it again later. Do not do this. Um, I've included this as an example because I, having first heard about paragraphs many years ago, started using paragraphs, did an approach this way, stopped working this way, I still think this is the most logical way to use paragraphs to represent components, but it is not the right way and it is not a good way. So when we're talking about nested paragraphs, what we're really saying is we have our component and then we have an entity reference to another paragraph to represent the atoms, right? So an entity reference to a header atom, which is another paragraph. That's nested paragraphs and you, the reason you don't do this is because you run into revision problems. Um, pretty much every time you click save on an entity in Drupal, it creates a new revision. And when you're nesting paragraphs, you end up clicking save and making 50 new paragraph revisions. So your revisions explode, causing your database tables to explode, causing performance issues. And it's just generally problematic. <coughs> I know paragraphs is trying to work on this and try to solve it, but as far as I know, it has not been fixed yet. So in this example, we have a template and we have the, the important part here is the middle where it says set content and it says field header, field description, field button. Now this looks nice and simple, right? You think you can read this and you understand what it's doing, but what does it really tell us? It tells us nothing. It says we're rendering field header, field description, field button, but it tells us nothing about the templates being used. It tells us nothing about what they're going to look like and it tells us nothing about the, the values that are actually being used or the data structure that is available. So. As a Drupal developer, this makes sense, and you can probably go dig out what this is doing. But as a front-end developer who doesn't know Drupal, it tells you nothing about what is actually happening. So at that point, you have to, as a Drupal developer, we know the easiest way to solve this is to go onto the front-end and look at the debugging that Twig spits out into the HTML. But that requires that we have a working local, it requires that we have our Twig debug set correctly, it requires that we know where to access this component on the site, and if we can't access it, that we know how to create it, um, so there's a high barrier to entry with this template for simply trying to work in it and trying to track down, I need to make a change to field header, how do I do that? So a couple of, uh, this gets into really the complexity of it. Like I said, 
that's the NT references to another paragraph. Don't do it. Just just don't. It's, it's not a good approach. If you have a site that's doing it, um, you probably want to start looking into purging your paragraph revisions so that your database table doesn't explode too quickly. And then the, the challenge of this approach for field header is that at minimum, there are six possible templates that can be being used to render that, that field. So if you don't have a working local, if you don't have Twig debug set up correctly, you have to go track down which, <clears throat> which one of these six templates is being used, and you have to know the patterns to go look for them, right? I pulled this off the documentation, but you have to know to go look for that documentation, and then know where to find these, either in your theme or in your custom modules or wherever it's going to be. So, some more issues. Um, once again, which templates does that template include? There's absolutely no idea from that, just from looking at that Twig file. Um, what preprocess functions are running? Once again, there's at a minimum, sec at a minimum six to check for for each field, and they can be spread across many modules and many themes. So there's just a lot to track down if you want to truly understand what's happening with one simple variable. And then you need to multiply the number of possible templates and preprocess functions by the number of fields that you have. So in this case, it's six times four, right? So 24 possible templates, 24 possible preprocess functions to check. And then, uh, what? Possibly, yes. I, I like to assume that people aren't doing preprocessing modules. I know people do, but hopefully it's an exception. It's, it's even excessive to also multiply by new modules. Um, and then a benefit of this, though, is that the processing logic for atoms can be all grouped together into the paragraph, right? So when, you're, when you have a preprocess for the atom, it can work on all the fields. And same for the template. It can group all the, the atom fields together into the same area. So there's a benefit to using the, this approach. It just doesn't outweigh the implications of performance um, and eventual database creep that you're going to see. Next, we're going to look at decoup a decoupled-ish approach. Um, and this is what I call reused fields. So instead of having a paragraph for the header, we're going to have three different header fields that are, excuse me, grouped together by field header underscore field name, right? So we have field header text, a field header display, and a field header element to represent the three atom fields that we need on our side-by-side -side component. And you can see here, instead of just rendering the field header, we're instead doing using an include statement to include an atom template or an atom tweet file and we're passing values directly by pulling, by using the, the, <clears throat> the field variable to get the value. So this is decoupled-ish because the template no longer is depending on Drupal to figure out what template to use to render the atom, but you're still dependent on the Drupal values to get the actual value that you're passing or the actual value that you're displaying. So you're still very much dependent in the, in the templating layer of, with Drupal knowledge for how to dig out a value from a trig variable. And how many of you have tried to dig out a URL to a file or to a media item in a Twig template? It is not simple um, and requires quite a bit of Drupal understanding of data structures. So decoupled-ish is how, how I'm calling this. Um, plus side for this is that the templates are explicitly stated and we've reduced the number of possible templates and preprocessing functions to only the ones that are needed for the entity, um, instead of having six for each field, essentially. Downside to this is that there's no way to really embed atom forms, right? So any form logic that you have that needs to apply to the header forms uh, needs to be either rewritten or written at a very high level where it could be impacting other forms, right? Like you need a generic form alter. You're not going to get a form field header alter um, to do any form modifications for your atoms. And then you also lose the ability to bundle your preprocessing logic for the atom fields. Because once again, they're just individual fields. It's not a group of fields that you can act on. And then, yeah, the, the downside, like I said, you have to dig values out of Twig, which is just a pain and ugly. Next approach is a fully decoupled approach. So you can see once again here we have include at atoms um, with header, right? Instead of with the individual values being put into an object, we just have a header variable. The question now is where did that header variable come from? And the answer is it comes from a preprocess hook, right? 
So instead of digging out values in the Twig template, you write a preprocess hook and you start digging out values using PHP, uh, which is at least a little bit easier to understand. There's a bit easier to find to debug and find examples for, and also your backend developers are going to be more familiar following this approach than um, working in the Twig approach. The downside, of course, is that you now need a preprocess function for every every component. So what this does, um, on the left I have an example of the preprocess hook that's just a content variable that's an array for the header, um, then we're setting text to the MC field value for your, um, for your text element. And then on the right is, is the example data structure that would be passed to the twig. So you can see it's very clean. We have a variable for each one of the, compo each one of the elements in our component. And if we go back to the, the template, we're just including um, the atom templates individually and passing the, the values directly to them because we know that the, the data structure is going to be correct and we can assume that that, that variable is going to work with that template. So that's a, that's a fully decoupled approach because in the template there is no dependency on Drupal, right? You're just passing values and it's passing <coughs> those values on to other Twig templates. Drupal has to do nothing there is most, the twigs just doing everything. So benefits to that is clean and easy to read, the data is prepared and ready for each template, uh, the templates in use are explicitly stated, and we've, once again we've reduced the number of poss possible pre-processing and template functions down to just the ones for them to see. The downside, once again, getting a clean data structure is, uses a lot of extensive pre-processing, which requires a, a certain amount of Drupal knowledge and a certain amount of PHP and backend knowledge. Um, once again, there's no way to embed the atom forms or to work on them holistically across the, the system. You have to work target them individually or target them at a very high general level. Um, then we, we also still have the downside of preprocessing logic can't be grouped together by atom because they're working at the component level. Uh, and you still have to dig out values in Twig. Oh, actually, that shouldn't be there. We don't have to dig out values in Twig. <laughs> All right, so that's paragraphs. Next, we're going to talk about Layout Builder, which is the other big competitor to paragraphs. First, Layout Builder approach is going to be custom blocks. Uh, so custom blocks are just content entities, which is what paragraphs are. So you can see everything I just said about paragraphs. It's, it's going to be the same. The unique thing about Layout Builder is going to be the inline blocks. So you'll look at this template, and it looks the same as the last one, right? I'll tell you, there's no differences. And the reason there's no differences is because it was a decoupled template. It doesn't matter where we're sourcing our content from for the template. We just need to make sure we're passing the values correctly to the template so they can render. So yeah, this, is, this is exactly the same as the previous one. The difference is in how we're getting the data structure created. So now, in the top left, instead of having a preprocess hook, we have a, a build hook because we're using inline blocks instead of custom blocks or an inline, um, or in, inline sorry, we're using, sorry, we're using an inline block instead of custom blocks or paragraphs. There we go. Um, so yeah, the benefit to an inline block is that it, it, it has a block class that has a build function where you can put all of your logic and you don't need to go put a hook somewhere in your theme or in a module. But oh, other benefit is that you're not necessarily digging through entities anymore. You're digging through a flat array of values because inline blocks store their values as arrays instead of um, as field objects or field items. But once again, we're creating the same data structure that we created for the last decoupled template. So benefits to inline blocks. You're defining blocks with the plugin system. Um, so there's one place for the block and it's typically fairly easy to track down. Um, downside to inline blocks, they're built with form API, which is also an upside. So form API, like I said, creates a much nicer data structure to work through. Um, downside to form API is that writing form API forms is a bit of pain and does once again require a lot of Drupal knowledge to write it, to do correctly. Um, and then yeah, values are easier to access when you're saving by through form API. Another benefit is that the build method provides that one place to do all the pre-processing instead of having it spread across multiple different pre-process hooks. So that's the benefits of inline blocks. A couple of additional ones. Um, these are all going to be the same as the decoupled approach for paragraphs. So templates in, in use are explicitly stated. We've reduced the number of possible pre-processing 
and template um, options, just the ones for the block. There's no, there's still no way to embed atom forms, and there's no way to pre-process the logic for a group of atom fields. So, after that very long preamble, why are components difficult? Because I haven't really answered that question. I just talked about how to build components, and the answer is because it feels like it's possible to create a component system in Drupal, but it's not. So it, everything we talked about, right, it sounds like you should be able to build a component system, but every single one of those approaches had significant drawbacks or significant dependencies on back-end knowledge of Drupal, which a pure front-end developer just isn't going to have. So all of your front-end development is dependent on back-end development. And that leads into the real reason, right? So the reason that it feels like it's possible is because you have an illusion of choice. Um, there's plenty of options for how to build components in Drupal, but they all depend on the same underlying systems, right? They all depend on NCA API, they all depend on field API, form API, and render API. So fundamentally, there are, there are issues modeling component data structures in those systems. And regardless of what combinations you do, you're going to run into an issue is pretty much the conclusion I've come to. Like, there, there's not a correct way to build a component system in the current state of those four APIs. And that, that's really why I think building components is difficult, because no matter which approach you take, there's going to be compromises, and they're going to impact you for the lifetime of the site. Um, the the low-level systems just aren't up to the tax on. And the big, the big differentiator, I think, right now is the, the whole concept of needing to embed atoms into molecules and molecules into organisms, or organisms. <laughs> <sighs> it's not recorded. Yeah, not, not recorded at all. Um, so yeah, being, having to embed um, components into other components creates a significant problem in Drupal's current version of Field API and current version of Form API to the point where it's really just not And because of that, the, the complexity of building a component in Drupal is not correlated to the complexity of the component itself. It's more dependent on how hard is it gonna actually be to build in Drupal. It's, off, it's off, often gonna be more difficult to build it in Drupal than the, you know, just looking at the component and saying, this is the header of text, the link in media, where the front end developer knocked this out in an afternoon. And that's because, like I said, like I was saying, it's not possible to effectively model component systems, um, system structures in Drupal. You really need that glue layer that ties your template to some form of data structure, some form, of, some form of authoring experience, and to build that effectively, you need backend developers, and you really need some very deep Drupal and PHP knowledge to do it in a way that creates a system that's functional and consistent, and a system that people really want to use. Um, I'm actually to the point where I'm starting to consider like Twig Tweak uh, a code smell. Because I think it's it's acknowledging that Drupal as a system is failing to deliver content or deliver values to a template in a way that's actually useful to the template. I'm not saying you never use Twig Tweak, but if you're using it a lot, it means that Drupal as a system is failing to get you the values you need in your template. Um, and because of the, like like I said, your front end implementation starts becoming bottleneck and dependent on back end development which is highly problematic because um, that requires a lot more a lot more communication, a lot more understanding of what's being built and work has to go through two people instead of one. And because that, that, uh, that glue layer that couples components and forms together is spread right now throughout Drupal, right? It's in templates, it's in tree process hooks, it's in whatever else you're using it's really hard to consistently do it the same way across Drupal because it's spread out everywhere. Um, and then it also makes it hard to find, if you're somebody new coming into a system or you're working on a part of the system you haven't worked on before, it makes it difficult to find and understand the code that exists um, and that's actually interacting with an opponent, which makes it difficult to either debug or add a new feature or to do something the right way according to how the system has been built. Um, it also makes it very difficult to explicitly document because you end up trying to document essentially the entirety of Drupal, which is a pretty much impossible task for a single team. Uh, and then you're and you're creating a living, creating a living style guide outside of Drupal is also very difficult because so many of these approaches depend on Drupal doing something to feed into the, the rendering layer. Um, now, 
the CL component library, the CL library um, that's being built is unique in that way in that I believe is actually using Drupal as a backend rendering server instead of just rendering trade directly through JavaScript, so that might solve some of that problem, uh, but I haven't tried that out yet. And then, so that, that glue layer being difficult to maintain means that eventually you're going to start making mistakes and that eventually the system is going to become intractable for authors, developers, and designers. Um, authors are going to slowly lose confidence in your system because invalid com content combinations or invalid field combinations are going to start to creep in and they're going to get unexpected results or things are going to break or things aren't going to look the way they expect them to look. Um, developers are going to get overwhelmed by the number of options and trying to identify the correct way to do something, right? If you have three different approaches to solve the same problem, which one is the correct one? Uh, and then designers, if they're trying to add on a new piece of functionality to the site, or if they're trying to revamp an existing one, if they can't get a grasp of what is there and what is available to them, they're just going to create something new. And that means as developers, or as a product team, we have to go create something new instead of reusing the same stuff that we have that could possibly solve the same problem. All uh, right, and all that creates a high, high barrier to development. So during your build, your, your implementation is dependent on Drupal backend skills, and then after the build, when the site is live and you're maintaining it, any maintenance or enhancements are dependent on Drupal backend skills, and it's dependent on any um, on implicit institu institution knowledge of the glue layer, which, like I said, can be very hard to discover. Um, and th this seems simple enough, right? What Drupal project doesn't have a backend developer on it? But why should your front-end work be dependent on Drupal backend developer, right? Why can't your front-end developer just get a design and start building? Why should it have to go through a backend developer to either create the content architecture, do some pre-processing, or do whatever they need to do to get to a point where somebody who only knows HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Twig can actually do something with a Drupal component? So that, that's really what I mean by a high barrier to development because you either need somebody with a lot more skills or you need two people with specific skills to get one piece of work done. All right, what can we do to make it easier? So I have a whole section here. Um, of Here's a bunch of core discussions that you can go look into, but I was gonna say that none of these have really have any traction and there's no discussion going on in any of them. And that changed literally two days ago. So I'm gonna skip over some of my other ideas for the sake of time. Um, I still think they're good ideas, but there's something, there's a been a development this week that is worth talking about instead. So, Mateo, um, which goes by this unpronounceable username, um, opened up an issue literally two days ago called Single Directory Components, which proposes that we create some a system in Drupal to allow us to define a component in a single directory. And that single directory would contain CSS, JavaScript, Twig, um, and a YAML metadata file. So this is a really interesting approach, and I would encourage you to go read this issue. Um, it's only been live for the past two and a half days, but I believe it's getting about a comment an hour right now. So there's a, a lot of enthusiasm in the community for both sharing solutions other people have built, as well as giving input on what they think um, should be done. And looking a bit more closely, this is the goals. I'm not gonna read all of them, because um, there's a lot. But the, the general concept is that Drupal should have a way to create a self-contained component that lives in a single directory and isn't dependent on other parts of Drupal to, do, to work correctly. So that would include even pre-process functions. Um, there's a, an approach here where like, each component would have its own PHP file. So that any PHP processing you need to be done, that needs to be done on that component could live with that component. So it's a really interesting approach. I highly recommend going to read it. I will be I'm still formulating my, my real response. I dropped one in yesterday with some initial thoughts, um, but I'm definitely aiming to get a real nice long response to that uh, up before the end of camp. All right, so next is questions, and I'm gonna answer the one that I think is coming most, which is how am I solving this problem right now? Uh, the first one is sprint planning. Like I said, there's a tendency on backend developers to really get work done right now. So if you acknowledge that, then you can start funneling all the back-end parts of your front-end components to back-end developers that sprint before um, your front-end developers actually need to work on it, so that when your front-end developers go to work, they have all the values on the page in roughly the right structure. Um, back-end developers aren't going to be perfect. 
they're not going to get HTML structures perfectly right. But if they get all the values on the page, it's easy enough for a front-end developer to go in and change them. So sprint planning is a big part of it, and just acknowledging that a back-end developer, and I'm, I'm going to paint with very broad strokes here from my experience. Um, if you disagree, I apologize. Um, but this has been my experience. Back-end developers typically move through configuration tasks, content modeling tasks, um, relational, like field entity reference tasks, a lot faster than front-end developers. I think it's just because they're more used to working with the, the internals of Drupal and they have a slightly better grasp of here's what the field formatters do, here's what the field types do, here's how they can all be used together to create a solution. Um, so I found that it's just a lot more beneficial to say, here's a component, here's its data, here's the data we need for it, and let a back-end developer kind of figure out what the data model is going to be for that, and then get them to put it in a template somewhere for a front-end developer to work on. And I think if you are a Fed who says, but Kyle, that's easy enough Drupal work, why can't a Fed just do it? Then congratulations, you're not just a front-end developer. You are a Drupal developer, or you're a Drupal developer that specializes in the front end, or you're a front end developer that specializes in Drupal, or you're a full stack developer, take your poison, um, but you're not just a front end developer. So that, that's one approach. Um, being a developer, I've also started to work on my own solution. So this doesn't fix all the problems we talked about here, but I've been working on a module called RJSF, which decouples forms from Drupal, uh, from the Drupal form system. So instead of collecting values through Drupal form API, we end up running a React form inside of a Drupal form, which means you laugh, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, I will look at it. Yeah. So it, it sounds funny, but it means that our form structure is not dependent on form API, and we don't have to create a fully built out form API to collect data. We just need to create a JSON schema, then then a form is rendered using React for that, and then it's embedded into Drupal through form API. Um, so that, that essentially decouples the entirety of our component structure and our form definition from Drupal itself, and Drupal is just con consuming JavaScript or JSON files. Uh, it also allows for generally better UX, I think. All these forms are built on Cherry UI, which I personally just like right, right now better than uh, Claro or even Jin. And because it's React, it's generally easier to find the skill set to build out new widgets or to develop new widgets. Um, on the right here, it's very difficult to see, but if you access the tiny URL, that's a color picker we actually just recently built uh, using RJSF, and it supports gradients, it supports transparencies, it's just a very nice color picker that is difficult to find right now in the control space in traditional Drupal. Uh, and then yeah, we get access to the entirety of the JavaScript and React ecosystem when we do want to build something new. So there's that. We've also been doing quite a bit of Aqueous Site Studio. Um, it has its ups and downs. It's certainly probably one of the best component building experiences I've seen, but it has other limitations and drawbacks, so it's not, it's not, a, it's not the solution to this problem, but it is a solution. Um, and it's certainly good for lower budget clients if they're already hosting on Aquia. All right, that brings us to questions. No, no questions? Well, yeah. so, I mean, this is an overwhelming amount of information you before the government. It really is. So, yeah, the as far as components go, in your solution of putting a React form into a Drupal form, the the use of Drupal as a backend is, is that something that that you appreciate, or is that just is that the problem? Um. I would say right now it is a problem for components, and this goes back to one of the core assumptions I made at the beginning, which is that components don't store data, they only store content, right? So Drupal is a very good data modeling system when you care about hierarchies and relations and data integrity and all that, but for components, like, we don't really care that much, or at least I don't care that much. Um, if a template understands how to render a data structure, that's all that really matters. So I don't need the rigidity or the, the definition that comes with field API or runs the API. I don't, I don't need independent revisioning of a component. I just need revisioning with the component's parent. Um, so yeah, right now there, there's a gap in being able to store this kind of flexible data, these flexible data structures in Drupal. 
uh, which is why the RJSF module actually just stores a JSON blob in a field in the database. So it, like, it doesn't break it out into individual values and, and individual tables for each field value. It's just one field that has a JSON blob in it. And then all the, the data validation and enforcement is done before or after save, before, before save or after loading it into a component. So yeah, there, there's a bit of, of a gap, I think. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things I skipped over here, which is there might be room for a component entity type, which is somewhere between a content entity and a config entity. To answer the, the question. Yeah. I mean, do you know Brian Hollandike from Penn State? He uh, did with the Hacks project. It doesn't sound familiar. Uh, he, he had a very similar approach, and then abandoned his proposal to go full on web components. Yeah. And that solved his Google problem. I think it, it's certainly a challenge for decoupled and this projects. All right. If there, I think if we have one more easy question. If not, we can call it here.